Hello, everyone. Welcome to this closing plenary session of EMA 2019 annual conference. So we've had an intense couple of days discussing pressing issues and problems in healthcare, and luckily we're going to end now with solutions. Uh, first of all, I am the moderator. We will be having people coming and go during this session, but the ones of you who have been here the whole time know who I am, but I am a journalist writing about health case, issues, and so on, and I will be guiding our proceedings today. Since there probably are people who haven't been here yet, some new faces, we'll just briefly discuss security. All the exits are marked in green. If you hear any announcement, please follow the instructions and leave the building. Uh, we'll first start with the Amazon Business Model and, and Health Tech Innovations Competition. I will invite Mart Vesinun to come and tell you about this. And then after uh, Mart has, and the teams have presented their work, we will have several other awards for um, excellent work that people have done here. But go ahead, Mart. Welcome on my behalf as well. Uh, my name is uh, Mart Vesinurm, and I have been the coordinator for the Amazon and Business Model and Health Tech Innovations uh, competition of 2019. So uh, for most of you, it probably doesn't say anything. So what is the Amazon and the BMI for project for short? It is 10 students of technology and business from all the university. It is five students from medical fields of University of Helsinki, divided into three groups, working for two weeks in an intense hackathon style uh, environment on one problem. Uh, this year, we have been, partnering, been partnered up with EHMA, obviously, Lääketietokeskus. Uh, uh, the Regional Council of Uusima and Aalto Health Platform. And the groups have been intensively working on the problem of e ecologically sustainable medication and how can we reduce the ecological impact of medicine. A very, very uh, current problem and uh, a large issue to tackle, in my opinion, in two weeks at least. Uh, for the competition, we will have, as I said, three groups coming up, uh, presenting their uh, solution concepts to you, and uh, they will be judged by our honorable jury, uh, Hanna Järvinen from Lääketietokeskus, if you just stand up and give a little wave. Uh, Mr. Pekka Rissanen from DHL. Mr. Usman Khan from European Patients Forum and Mr. Federico Lega from EMA, University of Milan. So, without further ado, uh, let's welcome to the stage our first group uh, and reducing the ecological impact of medicine, <laughs> surprisingly. Come on. Here you go. Good luck. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. We're going to talk about why and how to reduce the ecological impact of medicines, mostly from the perspective of pharmacists. I am Erla Malgosa, and as a future chemical and bioengineer, I hope to develop new pharmaceutical active compounds that can be produced sustainably. I, Suviela, as a future environmental engineer, wish to create better processes for the environment. I, Kaisla Kastenpohja, as a future psychologist, want to help people to make better choices for the environment. I, Ella Huttunen, as an information networks engineer, hope that the media will impact consumers in making more environmentally friendly choices in their daily lives. And Jalmari, as a future doctor, hopes to make a change for our health. So this is our group, and afterwards, we hope that all of us, uh, you, will be joining our project as well. So we're going to start with introduction of the topic, then move on to results from both the consumers and pharmacists' perspective, 
and then we're gonna move towards the solution that we came up and then end with conclusions. So think for a moment, how many percent of the purchased medicine end up in sewage in Finland? What do you think? According to Finnish Medicines Agency, the amount of medicine ending up in sewage is up to 20 to 40 percent. So why this is a problem? We don't have treatment processes for medicine, in, so everything end up in our ecosystem. So that would be 60,000 kilograms as a waste. Imagine with the amount. It's se almost 17 cars like in a mass. And with 95 to 125 million, we could bought over 300 Ferraris. We wouldn't want that. So, and we throw that away. Okay, so now we all know that this is a huge problem and we really need to do something. So we decided to do a little research. And next you're going to see some of our results. So in Finland you have to take your medicines back to pharmacies if you're, you're not using them to recycle those. And so we got 200 answers from consumers and as you can see most of them were 20 to 30 years old. And we asked if they take their left our medicines back to pharmacies and we noticed that even though a good amount of people take those back, there's this 30%, almost 30% that doesn't do it. And we think it's too much. But what we also found out was that 65% think that this is important or even extremely important topic. So something can definitely be done because people like to do what others are doing. And now we're trying to help everyone to take the first step. We interviewed a couple of pharmacists and the head of research department of the Finnish pharmacies, Yliopiston Apteki, about uh, what should we do? How to reduce the ecological impact of medicine or what are they suggesting? And in their answer, one thing was in common. Education. They want more education for both consumers and pharmacists alike. But it has to start somewhere. It has to start with conversation. And since we live in the 21st century, what better way to do that than through social media? And that is the key of our project. So, we now know that consumers are truly interested in considering the environmental impact of drugs, but not everyone are recycling their drugs to pharmacies. We have been searching, even though the need for something is obvious, nothing is happening at the moment. Pharmacists considered that we need more education, more information, and perhaps even social media. We have listened, and that's why we made a campaign. A campaign that unites the needs of consumers and pharmacists. This is what our website could look like. It's all about, all about happiness and vibrance. It's about social media. It's about contests. It's something that speaks to our audience and also speaks to pharmacists because they are the key element of our campaign. So this is what our Instagram could look like. You might ask, why do we want to focus on social media? Isn't that only for youngsters? But no, social media has been used uh, for a long time with adults too, and Instagram is mostly being used by 25 to 40 year olds at the moment. With our hashtags eco-conscious and medifree waters, we can keep count on our publicity all the time. But this is not all. We want to make uh, a contest. When you post something with our hashtag, you'll be participating. And we want to make it easy. How do we make it? Outside of every pharmacy participating, there will be a photo booth where people can take pictures with funny props and they can post them as seen in a picture. But would people do it? Well, I think they would because it's this easy.
and our study said the same. 40% said that they would participate and post on social media if there was a prize. And they hoped that the prize would be, for example, donating for a charity of their choosing or a free bicycle. So we want pharmacies to compete against one another. This way we'll get more results. On pharmacies participating, there would be a pharmacy scoreboard. On the scoreboard, you could see how many people have returned medicines to pharmacies during the campaign. The pharmacies with the most people will be shown on the scoreboard. They will be competing in different scales, big pharmacies, medium-sized and small, so that the competition would be fair. So, we now know that consumers would want to participate, but what about pharmacies? Why would they participate? Well, here's why. Free publicity, who wouldn't want that? On our websites, on our social media, with our hashtags, the pharmacy will get free publicity during the whole campaign. Of course, they will be rewarded. They'll get the stamp that's on the right, and they can use it on their websites and marketing for a whole year. And that's something that I think consumers will, will really appreciate. And of course, the scoreboard will activate customers because customers will want to support their local or otherwise favorite pharmacy. And lastly, and most importantly, do good for the environment. That's the whole point of the campaign. To conclude in this complicated topic, no matter if you work in the medical industry, are a doctor, pharmacist, or a consumer, you can be the star of a bigger change. We need the new technology from the industry. We need the information from the doctors and pharmacists to provide to consumers. But most importantly, we need the interest of consumers. And that is our key of the project. We hope that this campaign could be a kickstart to a better, brighter, and more sustainable future. Thank you. Thank you for the nice start for our uh, presentations. Now we have some time. If anyone in the uh, audience has any questions they would like to ask, we have uh, a little time for reserve for that. And I mean, if anyone wants to hire these uh, wonderful women to do their presentations in the future, I mean, you can contact me. I'll tell them you're offering your <laughs> job. I don't see anyone with her hands up, so I guess there won't be any questions. Let's give you one more applause and invite our next team aboard. So the next team. how doctors can promote more sustainable medicine. Can we get it open? Yes, we can. Yeah. Wonderful. And let's give a huge applause for you as well. The clicker is on the table. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ona, and I'm here with my fellow students Arne, Maria, Pirta and Rami to tell you about how doctors can, re can reduce the environmental impact of medicines. Uh, let me just start by asking you if I can get the clicker working. Are you concerned about the environment? Just raise your hand, please. Okay, that's good, thank you. Um, the next question. How many of you actually apply this concern when dealing with drugs? Well, that's a lot less. Just like doctors who answered our survey we conducted for the Pharmaceutical Information Center, turns out that 55% of the doctors do not consider the environment at all when prescribing drugs. Uh, 
Uh, so what we did uh, was an interview with Finnish Medical Association and an online survey targeting uh, medical doctors and medical students. Uh, we got 111 11 answers to our survey and the survey indicated that uh, doctors have a lot of will but not a lot of information to consider their, uh, the environmental impact of their decisions. Um, well, why is it a problem that drugs end up in the nature? Uh, the medicine affects the most when they end up in the nature. Um, basically, doctors prescribe too much drugs, and also the packaging size for most medicine is too big. So naturally, there's some leftover of medicine, which end up in the nature through improper uh, disposal. So, what could we do? What could specifically the Pharmaceutical Information Center do? What kind of information could they provide to eliminate these problems? Well, we asked the doctors and found out in the survey that almost all of them are willing to take the environmental effects into account when prescribing drugs, at least to some extent. And what they are missing, however, is the information. So what we need to do, we have to provide them with this information and rate drugs based on their toxicity and prevalence in the nature. And uh, yes, as, as you all know, doctors don't have too much spare time in their hands. So the information needs to be also really quick and easy to find. And we created this color scale system combined with a number grade for, for them. And also doctors want reasoning behind. They don't just go with those. So by clicking that leaf icon, you can see text describing why this specific drug is harmful or is not harmful and also instructions for the patient on safe and proper usage and disposal. So now as we have established what kind of information is needed, then the next aspect is that how the information should be available or where should it be available. So in our survey, we asked the doctors that where would they like to get the information from? And we got these three answers. These were the most popular answers. So first we have Tervesporti, which is a medical database that is operated by um, Nuadekim and Pharmaceutical Information Center provide some information to them. Then secondly, we have Pharmacafennica, a medicine database which is operated by Pharmaceutical Information Center. And lastly, we got the patient information system. So all these systems and databases have pros and cons. So the advantage with Terveysportti and Pharmacafennica for Pharmaceutical Information Center is that they already manage or provide information to these databases. So therefore, it would be easy to implement implement the information into these. But the disadvantage with these two is that they are hard to maybe use. They, you need to open up the database. If the doctor is familiar with the drug or medicine he or she is uh, prescribing, then he or she only uses, uses the patient information system and does not have time to open Terveysportti or Pharmacafennica. Therefore, the best place to find the information would be the patient information system. So it's extremely fast, but as we interviewed uh, the Finnish Medical Association, some people from there, they stated that it would be extremely expensive to update these databases, and especially they are, there are a lot of different information systems in Finland, so it would be an extremely large project to update these. But we suggest that all these three databases would have the information in it to have the best possible reach. But here we have kind of the optimal situation that we have the patient information system with the information quickly available. So, for example, if a doctor has a situation where there are two identical drugs that fit the patient equally well, the doctor can prescribe the more environmentally friendly one. 
but we do we still say that the patient's well-being is the number one priority so if there is a need to prescribe a drug with this red leaf the most kind of not environmentally friendly, then the doctor should remind and emphasize the proper disposal. So the main impact that the doctors will have in, the, in reducing the ecological impact of drugs and medicines is that they remind of the proper disposal. So even though the well-being of the, of the patients is always uh, the number one priority for doctors, um, we want you to consider these two figures. In our survey, we found out that the majority of doctors and medical students in Finland really think that there should be a wider discussion regarding the environmental impact of drugs. Yet, at the same time, only one out of five thinks that they currently have enough information regarding this topic. And we want to change these numbers. We think that every single doctor should feel that they can take part in solving this problem and that every single doctor should have access to the right information so that whenever they're dealing with medication, uh, they can base their decisions on facts. So how do we do this? There are three things. And first, small operational changes in clinics and hospitals. The patients, for example, could bring uh, redundant leftover drugs directly to the, to the doctor's appointment. Uh, and this would be easy for the patients. And clinics and hospitals already know how to securely handle drugs. This would also benefit the doctor because um, the doctor could uh, monitor and optimize the patient's medication. So no leftover drugs and pills in the future. Secondly, uh, education. We know, based on our survey, that doctors are willing to be educated on this topic. And finally, public campaigns. You may have seen this poster at today's event, and the idea behind this poster is very simple. If patients cannot use drugs responsibly, the chemical compounds in those drugs end up in the nature and eventually back into the patients. And if doctors think that they want to be eating fish, which is healthy according to doctors in the future, they should also feel concerned. So, we want you to leave today's, hold on, <laughs> today's event with a single very or very simple question. If you want to drink clean water, which glass would you choose? So, drink responsibly and use drugs responsibly. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. So uh, we again <laughs> have uh, reserved some time for any questions you might have. So just you know, raise your hand and wave a bit if you have anything to uh, ask the group. It's a funny GIF, definitely. I don't see I see any questions. Well, I guess that's that then. Thank you a lot. So, and for our next team, we will ask to the stage. Uh, innovations in drug disposal methods group. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you very much. I think we got this. I got that. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having us. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is João Hamelainen. I'm a student here at Aalto University, and today accompanying me is my colleague, Jihan Tsaki. 
And as you heard for the past few weeks, the three group of, uh, we've been tackling with the problems medicine cause in the environment. And I believe we've come up with a great solution, of which I wish to tell you about now. But first, let's remind ourselves, what is the problem exactly? Well, ladies and gentlemen, this right here is the problem. See, here we have a package of medicine. It includes a box, and then it has a piece of paper. And finally, well, the drugs themselves. So let's talk about the paper first, because we know every single one of these objects has an impact on the environment. So how about we forget all this information on this paper right now, because everybody knows that 90% of every one of you people right there will throw this, paper, this piece of paper away. Nobody reads painkiller information, nobody does that, so let's just forget about that. Let's put all of that online, ignore the paper in the package, then so everyone who actually needs their information can find it really quickly on the internet. We can slap a QR code on the box, everyone can scan it on their phone, get to the website, find their information right when they need it. All right. Well, you might have some questions. What about when my internet dies? Or let's say your phone runs out of batteries at the exactly wrong, exactly wrong moment. Well, there is a print option where you can print the papers you need. And let's say, for example, for elderly people who don't have that opportunity, who don't know how to use phones, well, they can ask the pharmacist. The pharmacist can ask them, sir, ma'am, do you wish to have a paper version of your medical information leaflet? And they will say, yes, please, and they will get that. That's a problem solved, let's forget the paper. It might even get rid of the box because all that box does is it stores the paper. There's a second box inside the box. Exactly my point. Uh, so that leaves us with what? We've sorted out the paper and the packaging. That leaves us with the drugs themselves, right? So first, let's go through some facts. As the previous group already pointed out, 20 to 40% of all medicinal waste ends up in water systems here in Finland. This is Finland's case which that causes hormonal changes in uh, marine life and fish might die of it. Let's not forget the fact that, as we are well aware of antibiotics and how they help super bacteria to grow faster, which might mean that I might die, right? So that's, those are the facts. So let me just ask, everybody knew this already? Can I have a show of hands? Like who knew medicine causes harm to the environment? Okay, I see everyone. Okay, perfectly. So that, that's common sense. That's common knowledge, at least. And we did a, a quick survey asking people about it, and 20, uh, the vast majority did actually say they knew about the importance of recycling medicine, but only 40% actually do, a bit more, but less than half. So what can we do about this problem? Well, one option is something that is already used in some countries, for instance, here in the lower picture, you can see a picture of a medication disposal box in the United States. Places people can actually put their medicine in and where they will be taken out by a certificate person. They, they can look a bit like mailboxes like that. If we allocate these sort of boxes in different parts of cities, say, of course, hospitals and pharmacies, but say a, a, your waste management point in your neighborhood, in more places in general, people might actually return their meds. So we, the problem is we need a larger network for people to return them because currently in Finland, pharmacies are the only place where you can take them. So. Well, we thought there was an issue in this which might be safety because, well, people might get into it. Somebody might want some old drugs, who knows? So we thought, okay, well, more locations was still, based on our survey, the most wanted solution for this when we asked the common public. But the second biggest answer was a financial incentive. People want money, all right? People like to be paid. So we thought, all right, how can we combine these two large portions of answers? Well, it was pretty simple. First, we looked at how bottles get recycled in Finland. Right now, there is a small amount of money tacked onto this bottle. Right now, for this one, it's 20 cents. When you put it inside this hole right here, you get paid 20 cents, the bottle goes to the back room, it gets into a dis gets to a box, and it gets stored there and taken to the recycling center. And well, this system works perfectly because 90% of bottles in Finland get recycled. Uh, when compared to plastics elsewhere, well, it's a big difference. So what about we do a small change? We just add, we just change the code in this machine so that it accepts medicine. It takes your boxes, it gives you a certain amount of money, 
and it takes it to the back room and stores it somewhere. All right, well, this system, a bottle system, is already implemented in various countries, so we all know everybody globally could take this really quickly, it could go really fast. So that one was our solution, combining medicine disposal with bottle recycling, despite whether or not you even have medicine in your bottle. So that way, people will get used to it. I finished my drugs, I'll put it in the box, I'll get my money and I'll go on my merry way. That's the financial incentive. So what about the locations? So uh, here we have a picture of um, the Helsinki and Espo area right now. And he, this, these are all the pharmacies located in this area. If we add the stores, you can see that the network, well, increases substantially. There are a lot of more places people can actually return their medicine. Here's yet another example of Iisalmi, a city cent located in center Finland, rural area. These are the pharmacies and these are the stores in there. So it, it can actually be applied in rural areas too. So let's recap a little bit of how the system works right now. You get your expired pills, you decide, all right, you have to walk to a pharmacy, the pharmacy sorts them, takes them out to a certified delivery man who takes them to the chemical waste management plant. Our system only adds a new lane. You instead go to the store, get paid, you're happy, and the pills keep on going the same old route. Either they go to the pharmacy or they just skip that, that part completely, go to the truck, and go to the waste management plant. It's very simple, ladies and gentlemen. Exactly. So, why is this a good thing? Well, it's a very... This will help reduce a lot of medicinal waste, but because it will build upon an existing infrastructure, it, it's already in place in multiple countries as well. Uh, the minimal changes in logistics, well, they are minimal for the fact that the foundations are already there and there are no additional impact on the environment once more because it is already there. We're, so we're not adding more weight on the environment. And I believe, we, our team believes, this is truly one way we can reduce the impact medicine has on the environment. And hopefully one day I will not die of a super bacteria. Or any of you for that matter. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen. We want to thank our teammates who worked really hard on this project and also we'd like to thank the people who ran this court, Mar Marth right there and Elena right there sitting. And also we would like to thank the sponsors we have on this course as well as you, the audience. All right. So any questions? There's a question right there. We had about 120 answers on our survey, which involved people from various age groups, but mainly people under 35, and uh, the rest of the people got distributed pretty evenly for the older age groups. We also did uh, take part in last week's Health and Technology co Conference, where we gathered some more, well, people, professionals took part in the survey, but we also gathered some, some more professional input on the matter. Any other questions? In the uh, back, please. Uh, Ma'am, at the back. Yes. Well, um, you said you had a very simple solution and that the adaptation of the machines would be very simple. Uh, can you explain a little bit more about that? Because I think it might be quite difficult, actually, to adapt that. And also, uh, maybe there are some adaptations necessary uh, in, the, in the medicine part because they have to recognize the medicine, etc. Can you explain a little bit more? Um, let's say when you return your medicine, when you asked about the sorting thing, the machine of course already sorts bottles, so it can also see what medicines, what drugs have, let's say halogens, iodine, bromine, and it can of course sort them to a safer box. Let's say you can also take antibiotics. We can also affect how people return those medicine by adding a different amount of price to it. Let's say antibiotics could be paid double the price for the money that you would get for a regular drug. And also for the code change, I think the machine already has every single thing you have, you need for it because it has a sensor, it has a weight sensor. All you need to change is what barcodes it reads, right? When you put a barcode in, it already reads the piece of medicine and it goes into a specific location for that drug. Yeah, there could be multiple containers for different drugs which can then be taken back by a certified person. Did that answer your question? <laughs> good, good. Uh, I 
I think that's a really small subset of people who would actually do that because I feel like nobody really needs expired medicine, but if they really do, that's fine because you've already paid for the part when you purchased your medicine, so technically you're allowed to do that. I really think that won't be that big of an issue when it comes to the whole picture because 46% right now return their medicine. Even if we get that percentage to, let's say, 85 and 15% of people just decide to keep their meds, that's okay because it's already a substantial increase in the previous percentages that we've got. What about you, ma'am? Already very expensive, so then people wouldn't afford uh, to buy it. Some people. Um, the price yes. wouldn't be dependent on how expensive the product actually is. It would probably just be a certain amount for a specific types. So let's say we could say, of course, we, ha we need more data on how much of these are actually returned. But let's say if we put on a price of 5% of the price, I don't think that'd be worth it. For a bottle, it's 20, it's 20 cents. I think that would be enough for people to return their regular painkillers, right? People already have them lying around, so it's not that big of a deal. For those bigger, more expensive pills, I think, you just need to have a small thing to get you to drag you to the store. That's like the more, most more important thing, so that you're actually aware and you get something in return. The price doesn't have to be really that big. It can be like a, a dollar, it can be 20 cents, it can be 50 cents, depending on how, of course, the data tells us when yeah. this might get implemented. We, we do need to, this is only a demo, we do need to do some more research on this, but was there one, one more question? Right, so um, who would actually pay for the disposed medicine? So, like we said, uh, when, when the, pack, the packaging will have a barcode and that sum will actually be paid by one up, one, we could apply, we could put the customer to pay it for in advance, so, so to say, put a deposit and once returning the product, he will then regain that sum he deposited originally. So that's the incentive of the pre person to return the medicine. Let's say who pays for the system, you could even add a small amount of money that eventually builds up to pay for the system itself. It just depends on how long you want to, what's the return on investment, how you want that to work. If you can, can add 10 cents for every piece, and slowly that'll pay for the whole system then. Any other questions? All right, I think that was it. Yeah. And, and again, thank you very much. You were a great audience. Thank you very much, guys. I, b I believe there are many people who would like to hire you now in the audience. It's a very good presentation. But for now, uh, the judges will retire uh, to the uh, outside the hall to uh, judge our teams. And uh, during that time, I will give uh, back over to you. Thank you so much to the teams. Such excellent solutions. My suggestion is that we implement all of them. So next, I would like to invite to the stage Mats Bromels from the Karolinska Institute, and he will be handing out the joint award by Karolinska Medical Management Center and EMA. Please welcome Mats Bromels. Thank you, and good afternoon, everybody. This is now the 17th time that we will be uh, uh, presenting the Karolinska Institute at Medical Management Center slash EMMA Research Award, which was originally founded in order to stimulate early career researchers to uh, engage themselves in healthcare management research. Um, I'm very glad to be able, just in a minute, to present the finalists. But first of all, I need to tell you that uh, this is indeed a real competition. We invite submissions when uh, the annual conference is advertised and uh, the EMMA Scientific Advisory Committee is then assessing those abstracts and uh, shortlist a small number of uh, submissions that are invited to give an oral presentation during the PhD session. So being a finalist in itself is a great achievement. And I would like our, our, our finalists, you can find their names on page 40 in the program, to stand up. And uh, 
You can't see anybody. Right. You give them a warm hug. I have all the spotlights on my face, so I have difficulties to see. But I think I, two persons, actually identify themselves. Uh, I'm afraid some of them have left the conference. Um, but let me just briefly present all of them to you and, and the important work they've, they've done in the order of appearance. First of all, Dr. Tia Reho from uh, the University of Tampere in uh, Finland. She uh, presented a register-based study of frequent visitors to primary health care offered by occup occupational health services in Finland. And uh, she could show that these frequent visitors had a high risk of sickness absence and sickness pensions. These gross consumers of health care services uh, are usually certainly using other services as well, which calls for strategies to identify those high-risk patients and also to make sure that they receive a better care coordination. Dr. Bart Noort from the University of Groningen in uh, the Netherlands presented case studies from uh, the UK, Sweden and uh, the Netherlands focusing on healthcare purchasers rather than providers, and uh, the institutional logics that those purchasers uh, used. Um, he uh, identified as the ideal uh, uh, purchaser one who acts as an orchestrator of service providers, but often those purchasers relapse into being simply bookkeepers. Uh, Dr. Nina Zipfel from the St. Antonius Hospital and Radboud Institute for Health uh, in Nijmegen, the Netherlands, had uh, studied a quality improvement project aiming at increasing protein intake prior to surgical procedure for aortic valve disease. Uh, the project indeed succeeded in increasing the intake but uh, no significant improvement in terms of resource utilization or outcomes could be shown. Uh, outcomes measured as 30-day mortality. But indeed highlighted the value of register-based data when studying outcomes and aspiring to apply value-based healthcare. Uh, Dr. Dan Vestra from the Maastricht University summarized his PhD project consisting of six different conceptual and empirical studies on competition in the Dutch healthcare market by applying social network analysis and uh, focused specifically on what kind of cooperative interorganizational strategies that uh, providers by and large would employ. He showed that competition in itself does not promote cooperation. But areas where there is fierce price competition, that seems to force providers to integrate themselves horizontally, specifically within one catchment area or geographical area, which paradoxically might lead to less competition rather than more competition, which is a challenge for policymakers and regulators. And then finally, Dr. Jens Jakob Fredriksson from Karolinska Institute, he reported um, two literature studies looking at value-based healthcare as a management concept and found out that that concept is superficially understood, but yet widely applied and uh, highlighted the need for a provider to pay attention to First of all, how value is best created, secondly, delivered, and finally, captured. And one strategy to manage this uh, uh, threefold task is to apply business model thinking, which Jens Jakob then uh, further studied in one university hospital and among competing 
perinatal clinics in the Stockholm area. I can almost physically feel the tension now when uh, I would like to ask the EMMA staff to assist me when I now will announce the winner. Uh, are you ready? We are. Okay. So, the winner is Bart North from the University of London. May I ask you to uh, enter the stage? So, here is the scroll. Now, if you can put on your wall. Yes, I will. I guess it's candy, I don't know. Yes. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, as you so from the program, uh, now it's not only the honor that we, we have been awarding, we have also a check worth 1,000 euros that I will present to Bart. And I would now like to invite Bart to uh, give his presentation for the full audience of the, the annual conference. Uh, it's a bit like the Eurovision Song Contest, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, this is a bit overwhelming, of course. I'm really happy and uh, I really appreciate this prize. Um, I have to admit I was slightly informed about this thing, so I'm not, I'm a little bit prepared, but still, uh, uh, yeah, really excited. So I hope uh, I will uh, be able to tell everything I, uh, I want to. Um, First of all, of course, uh, acknowledgement to my supervisors, uh, Kees Aarhus and Taco van der Vaart, who really supported me in this, and yeah, without uh, their support, uh, I couldn't uh, uh, do my research uh, at all. Um, yeah, so I'm really happy to present you some of my work, uh, which I also did uh, yesterday. Um, yeah, my thesis, oh, I have to correct, actually, Mats a bit. I'm, I'm not a doctor yet. I'm in the final phase of my uh, of my PhD uh, program, so in the last uh, month, so I'm uh, finalizing, and this is, I think, uh, encouragement to do that soon. So my uh, thesis is about healthcare purchasing, um, and, and, and we question actually how can healthcare purchasers like insurance companies uh, or governmental organizations, how can they act as a care chain orchestrator, essentially? Um, so what you see here, you see here a, a, a care chain, um, and you see that the healthcare purchaser has an important position in such a care chain. Um, so healthcare purchasers, that can be insurance companies in the private systems or uh, governmental organizations like you see in England who uh, contract care based on tax. And they have an important position as a payer of care services, especially, we think, uh, when paying for services for chronically ill patients. So what you see on the bottom side of the scheme here is that, um, maybe I should talk like this. Um, patients with a chronic disease, like COPD patients who have a lung disease, they need to receive care from multiple providers. So for example, they have to go to the general practitioner, um, but they can also be referred to the medical specialist in the hospital. And what we expect is that uh, these different care providers, they uh, work together they refer the patient when needed and refer them back to each other and they exchange information between each other. And as a purchaser of care, um, the, the purchaser can influence how this care is delivered and whether actually 
collaboration and good task division is present in such a care chain. They can do that by contracting care, by paying care, by giving incentives, by setting quality standards, and also uh, by ne negotiating. And this, this role of healthcare purchasers is also acknowledged, I think, by society, but also by researchers. So what is expected from these purchasers is that uh, they uh, act as, uh, strategically and they try to improve how care is delivered from a health and from a population perspective. But what we also know from uh, quite some research on healthcare purchasing is that actually uh, this is often not the case. So what we see is that healthcare purchasing organizations, they tend to focus still a lot on costs. They, uh, they act uh, very administratively, formally, uh, and on, on short-term cost control. Um, what we furthermore know is that uh, in different healthcare systems, in different countries, we can identify different tools that the purchasers may have and that can enable them to act as a strategic purchaser. Um, so there can be different financing schemes in countries like pay for performance or shared savings or fee for service. There are different quality measures that give transparency in the healthcare system. And there can also be high or low provider competition, which uh, can give the purchaser the choice to contract different providers. So this is very important. But what we think, uh, how we can improve knowledge on healthcare purchasing is by going a step further, by thinking about how do actually healthcare purchasing organizations, how do they develop a strategy, uh, their behavior uh, and, and logics within their organization. And from management literature, we know that actually that uh, organizations, they, they create uh, gradually, they develop cultures, strategies, based on the goals that they have, based on the rules that there are, or the relationships they have with different uh, stakeholders around them, and the dependence they have towards different stakeholders. Um, so this is a very subtle process, and uh, we think it is interesting to look at healthcare purchasing organizations in this way, to get a better understanding of how they act in a certain way and why. So the goal of, the, of uh, or how we try to answer this question is we first of all want to understand how do such purchasing strategies, how do they follow from uh, health policy and regulation? Uh, and secondly, um, how are they shaped uh, by different pressures that purchasers experience uh, from the stakeholders around them? So the thesis is structured uh, in this way. Um, first of all, we like to address this issue on a health, pol health system and policy level. So we, we ask the question, how do healthcare system characteristics, how do they influence uh, purchasers' strategies and actions? Secondly, we look more at the care chain management or at the stakeholder level, where we ask, how do stakeholder pressures around the purchaser, how do they affect the purchaser's institutional logics? And lastly, we take more the patient or the outcomes level uh, where we ask, so how does in the end healthcare purchasing contribute to better chronic care delivery? And today I especially focus on the first two questions. Um, so I will discuss two studies, two qualitative case studies. And the first one is a comparative uh, health system analysis. Um, and uh, here we ask the question, how do healthcare system characteristics affect purchaser strategies and actions? We compared the healthcare systems of England, Sweden, and the Netherlands, and we picked in each country one specific region. And these regions were vanguard regions where the healthcare purchasers had special freedom to uh, act as an active purchaser and try to uh, 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 stimulate improvement of care delivery. And we specifically looked at chronic care delivery, and actually COPD care. So during the case study, we uh, studied how do these purchasers in these areas, how do they pursue improvement of task division and collaboration between uh, providers and specifically uh, primary and secondary care providers when delivering COPD care. Um, so a little bit about the different regions that we chose. Our main case selection criteria was uh, whether there was a public or private purchasing system. And in England, there is a, um, tax-based system, so there's national taxation and there are regional clinical commissioning groups who are responsible for purchasing care in every region, so that is a tax, a public purchasing system. Sweden as well, but there is regional taxation where county councils uh, conduct purchasing. And then the Netherlands is actually a private uh, purchasing system where there are different health insurers who compete with each other for members and who thereby provide the budgets for care uh, contracting. And in the Netherlands, we picked one region where there is 
one big health insurer who has about 60% of the population is member with their insurer. Um, so we did interviews there and uh, document analysis. Um, and what we first did, we looked how did these different purchasers in each region, how, what strategies and actions did we find on how they tried to improve COPD care delivery. And we, from the data, we found seven different categories of these strategies and actions, which are shown in this uh, table. And we found significant variation among the different uh, health care systems in the, the different specific regions. I don't have time now to uh, discuss this whole table, but I think this is important to see that we found especially these categories and the variation. And what we did next is, uh, especially based on the interviews of all the different people in the regions, um, we tried to understand how can we explain this variation of strategies and actions by uh, the, the most important healthcare system characteristics that influence uh, this purchaser behavior. Uh, and what we found, we deduced from the data three what we think are the most key healthcare system characteristics, and these are um, purchaser competition, uh, purchaser governance, and patient choice. And we'll, I will discuss them uh, each briefly. So what we find is that um, in England and Sweden, there is, of course, low purchaser competition, because essentially they have a purchaser monopoly. But in the Netherlands, uh, there's competition between the health insurers. And we find that um, when there is high competition between healthcare purchasers, it drives a more short-term purchasing strategies focusing on the cost. Well, when uh, there is low uh, competition between purchasers, uh, there is more attention for a uh, care chain-wide perspective when purchasing um, the patient itself and its role in the disease, and also a, a long-term focus and focus on prevention. So that's, uh, for example, what we also see in England, where the purchaser really tried to implement a 15-year population-based uh, uh, contract. Then moving to purchaser governance, we find, uh, we distinguish managerial and clinical governance. And in England, uh, the clinical commissioning groups, they are led by general practitioners. So here's clear clinical governance. Um, while in the Netherlands, there's more uh, kind of a business organization, uh, not so much involvement of doctors. Uh, and in Sweden, a bit as well. Here's a, it's a more a political system uh, where it's, uh, yeah, we think managerial governance dominates. And here we find that when there is clinical governance, it really benefits the relationships that purchasers can build with providers. Um, and also, it, it drives, seems to drive more support towards uh, providers when trying to improve care delivery. Then lastly, looking at patient choice, we actually focused on uh, choice of patients to move between primary and secondary care. And we see that in England and the Netherlands, there is a GP a gatekeeper system. So here, um, yeah, it is the general practitioner who determines whether a patient is referred to the hospital. While in uh, Sweden, there is a free patient choice law and patients tend to go really easily to outpatient clinics and use a lot of specialist care. And in actually all these regions and in a lot of countries, it is a trend to try to have patients, uh, especially chronically ill patients, being treated in primary care. And in Sweden, that is very hard for purchasing organizations to manage that. So we find, in this sense, that high patient choice, it limits the purchaser to, to pursue their improvement agenda. So that's uh, what we find in study one. So the most important that we find that purchaser competition, purchaser governance, and patient choice are very important in shaping purchaser strategies and actions. Now the second study is a longitudinal single case study we did in the Netherlands, again in the context of COPD care. And here we tried to follow uh, one uh, uh, health insurer who uh, initiated or who, who, who was willing to try to improve delivery of COPD care and try to collaborate with several care providers in one province. Um, so they, they initiated several initiatives that we followed. Um, we followed that for several years. And what we mainly try to do is we try to explain um, the purchaser's uh, approach towards improving COPD care by distinguishing different institutional logics. So we knew at the start of the study that this health insurer was willing to improve care. So somehow um, we, we expected that there was more this kind of orchestrator's logic that we, we expected. And they also actually, they, they mentioned that they wanted to do this for the whole population, so, so from a chain-wide perspective. 
So we tried to look for that logic, but at the same time we also knew that probably there would also be another dominant logic, which is the bookkeeper's logic. So there may be their more default logic. So we tried to distinguish these two logics and find it in the data from our observations and interviews. Uh, and then we wanted to understand how different stakeholder pressures that the purchaser would encounter from the different parties around them, how that would influence whether these two logics would uh, emerge and which one would be dominant. So quickly an overview, when we followed this whole project, uh, you see on the y-axis we put the two logics, so in the bottom is the bookkeeper logic and then higher is the orchestrator's logic. And what we find indeed at the beginning, of, of course, there was a lot of activity of the health insurer. They uh, initiated several uh, collaborations, meetings where we also attended. Uh, they made agreements, prepared business cases, so they were very active and real relationships um, developed with healthcare or, or with care providers. So we see that as uh, the orchestrator's logic really emer emerging in the purchaser organization. But then as the projects develop, developed, which were actually really uh, successful medically, um, we saw that uh, the purchaser had difficulties to move on with these projects, to finance them on long term, to create better incentives, to ena enable these projects to be more successful. Um, and also, yeah, we saw more tension emerging again between the purchaser and providers. So that's what we see as kind of a relapse falling back into this old bookkeeper way of thinking. And we uh, try to explain this pattern by mapping the different tensions from the different stakeholders around this, this healthcare purchaser. So you see the purchaser logic is in the middle, so the purchaser itself actually, and we find that mainly care providers, um, subscribers, so members of the insurer, uh, and governments, they uh, uh, give the most pressure towards the purchaser. And we uh, distinguish, um, on the left side, we see that providers especially, they give relational pressures. So the uh, relationships build up between providers and the purchaser, trust builds up, but sometimes actually there is tension and low trust. And then secondly, providers also uh, give uncertainty to the purchaser because they are the ones who deliver care and they know what happens and the outcomes of care but they can also, of course, reduce this uncertainty. Then subscribers, they uh, give on the one hand cost pressures, they want low insurance fees, but they also want, of course, uh, the best care, so they also have medical demands. Uh, and then finally, uh, the government, they have public health demands, but they also have these cost uh, pressures and, and medical demands. So um, we found actually two patterns which for us explain uh, whether this bookkeeper's logic or orchestrator's logic is present within the purchaser. The first is that uh, when one uh, of the pressures increases or decreases, it actually uh, determines how the purchaser internally uh, deals with other pressures. So an example of that is that um, during the different projects that were set up, uh, relationships in, uh, build up between the purchaser and providers, and somehow, so that's a relational pressure, somehow it made the purchaser be more flexible with uncertainty. So when there were business cases uh, arranged, the purchaser at some point said, oh well, it's not a very good business case, but uh, we have to go on with it and we just have to sell it within our or organization. Well, so we thought that was very interesting, but on the other hand, when there was more cost pressure, all of a sudden these relationships were more under pressure. So the, the purchaser dealt in a different way with the relationships there were. So that's the first kind of pattern that we found. And the second pattern is that we see that also the purchaser's internal organization shapes how they uh, deal with the different uh, pressures around them. So we saw quite some fragmentation in the internal organization of the health insurer, uh, for example, between the purchasing department and the medical department. And we see that, for example, when cost pressures increase, that the medical department is less able to also deal with uh, the medical demands or maybe with the collaborative and relational demands. Um, so that's the main finding of study two about the institutional logics, which to us explain the purchaser uh, behavior. Um, one short remark about this slide, yesterday I didn't have time for it. This uh, slide relates to the project that I presented before this, and we're doing actually uh, economic and uh, health impact analysis on one specific project that emerged from the collaboration between the insurer and providers, and that is a COPD coaching project. And um, yeah, we're still analyzing the data, but what we see is that 
Um, so patients are being coached when they had several hospitalizations within a year. And what we see that at the start of the coaching project, they, are very, uh, they have many hospitalizations. And after the coaching, it seems to decline. And uh, this is preliminary and partly there, there is, this peak is, is not really fair to, to, to see as kind of the default for these patients. So actually here we see patient costs related to hospitalizations uh, and hospital visits. But what we clearly see is that there is, seems to be a decline in hospital visits, hospitalizations. So that's very promising. But then we see that this is apparently very hard to continue with such kind of projects and to make agreements on how to make uh, usual care out of this. Um, which we think is, shows actually that apparently purchasers struggle with these kinds of questions and struggle with their role. And I think this uh, yeah, shows that it's very important to think about how can we improve uh, healthcare purchasing? How can we support uh, them also to develop their role? So to finalize, I would uh, yeah, like to finalize with two statements. How can uh, purchasers become care chain orchestrators? First of all, I think that um, yeah, governments should create the right policy context um, and the right incentives uh, not only for providers, but also for the purchasers themselves. Um, and uh, yeah, there needs to be a good power balance between purchasers and providers. So purchasers also need to be able to steer the care chain. And then lastly, purchasers themselves have to, have to think about their internal organizations, uh, which can also enable uh, them to fulfill their role. Um, one last thing, I forgot to acknowledge for the first paper that we submitted that, and here we collaborated also with uh, Naomi Chambers from Manchester Business School and Rod Schief from uh, Plymouth University. Um, and I would like to finalize with that. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Bart. And congratulations yeah, again. Thank you very much. Please. Sure, does anybody have questions? Bart would we'll be happy to answer some. Go for it. I think we have time. If not right now, then you can catch him later. Congratulations again and thank you. Uh, so next, we will be presenting the EMMA 2019 Best Poster Award. And I would like to invite to the stage EMMA board members, Ellie Bredwold and Axel Kene to present the award. Thank you very much. Oh, there's very strong light. <laughs> you must have experienced it this already for three you days. You're used to wow. it after a while. Um, yeah, um, we'll keep it very short. Um, uh, it wasn't an easy task to um, to select the best uh, poster uh, this year. There were um, many, many good posters. Um, but there was one that catched our eye, literally, I think, and I would like to ask on the stage now, Tessa van Dijk, is she here? <laughs> Tessa. Your poster, welcome on the stage. Your poster um, shows a very well designed, theory driven uh, research um, with a clear research question. I'll keep it short, I will mention, but I, I would like to mention the, the, the research question because it also very much relates to the conference theme. It's how have relationships between healthcare organizations executives and finances changed over time and what new skills and competencies does this require from the manager 2.0 so that was a long a long sentence but to be short your your poster shows uh, innovative information it presents a significant contrib contribution to the field um, it's it's of good quality uh, the research design the results uh, it shows, 
And last but not least, I already said it, uh, it catched our eye because it was very well designed, which deserves a compliment. Um, it was a very clear structure, the graphs were very nice, and the conclusions were very clear. So, I would like to ask Axel to hand over the prize. Congratulations. Thank you and congratulations, Tessa. And is your poster still here? Can people see it? Yes, so after the event, the posters are still in the exhibition hall, so make sure to take a look at them. So next, we will do the EMA 2019 Best EU Paper and Non-EU Paper Awards. And I would like to invite Professor uh, Federico Lega to come and present those. Oh, you're there already. <laughs> <laughs> Quick action. Good. Yes. Good. Uh, go for it. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, it's my privilege as the owner on behalf of EMA to uh, award uh, this to um, uh, paper award. The first one goes to the pe best European paper award, and the winner is Professor Andrew Walton. Andrew, are you here? It's not here. So I think oh, guys, we can give applause to Andrew. <laughs> We're gonna give it to him later. Second. IMA 2019 Best Non-European Paper Award goes to Dr. Sarit Raskovic. Again. <laughs> <laughs> well. we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna send it to him. Yes. I want to award at least one, but <laughs> no way. And we have more awards coming, and Federico will present this as well. Yeah. Uh, I really want to thank you again, uh, uh, our host. I think everyone really appreciated so much the venue, the organization, the fantastic uh, uh, midsummer or white nights uh, uh, dinner. So everything really, really uh, went perfect. So uh, I, I would like to have here on the stage, uh, first of all, our uh, host institution from uh, hospi hospital, University Hospital of Helsinki, Irma and Marku. If you can please join me up here. So thank you so much, Irma, thank you so much, Marco. Uh, this is uh, on behalf of EMA, we really appreciate it, everything that you've been doing for us in the last month, year almost, uh, and everything was really perfect. And all, all the people I talked to really uh, appreciated, really were happy for, for the conference and the organization. So this is for you. <laughs> and some sweet. <laughs> so. Thanks. Thank you very much. Can we just thank take you. a picture with, uh, with Michele, yes. one second? Yes, okay, if you want thank you. Say yes. something? Yes, but I want to thank you, the audience, and I want to thank our, all our volunteers and all our people, especially our secretary, Nette, who has been doing actually the major of the work, not me, but thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. And then I'd like also to invite on the stage uh, uh, THL uh, friends that help us so much also in organizing the conference. So Marina, Ilmo, and uh, Sala, if you can join us here on the uh, stage. I see Marina over there. I guess it's you, right? <laughs> For all of them. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you want to say something? Yes. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Ah, you okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Take that. Uh, here is the... Okay. Thank you very much on, on behalf of all of us. And I, I think that uh, once again in 10 years, more or less, we will have repeat this and have it once again in uh, Finland. Sure. I, I hope so. And by that time, I think maybe we also have our health sector reform done. 
<laughs> Thanks to AMI, the conference. <laughs> Uh, next, going quickly to the conclusion, I want to thank the um, uh, keynote speaker, uh, Elias Stupka. He's not with us because he had to go back home, but um, uh, we were ha very happy uh, having him with us. And also, uh, I think the plenary session that he conducted was really, really uh, good, uh, really much appreciated by everyone. Uh, so we're going to deliver to him uh, a finished present, a certificate, and then uh, because uh, we, uh, we have sustainability as the, 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 the major uh, issues behind the conference and because Emma has been always been uh, very close uh, uh, to the sustainability issues and as a specific policy and attention to the sustainability issues, uh, we also decided to uh, um, uh, give to um, uh, Elia uh, one uh, arbor seal adopted from the uh, Finnish uh, bay. So we're going to also provide him with uh, this uh, duty, basically, to take care uh, at least for a year uh, of one of the uh, arbor seals. The arbor seals are protected as a, as a sp uh, species protected because they're uh, under the threat of extinction. So we thought actually it was actually uh, a good way also to celebrate uh, his participation to the EMA and, and the topic of sustainability, which actually uh, is so, so close to our health. And, and it's so important for everyone in the care field. Uh, if we don't give applause because it's not here, we give it. Yes, we give it applause also to, to Elia. <laughs> Last but not least, we have... Uh, we are moving. Amazon, yes. That's your field? Yeah. Yes. Yes. I wanted to ask, though, the harbor seal that is adopted, is that in Boston, in Elia's hometown? Uh, no, I think it's here, right? Where is it? The harbor seal. It's not specified. It's not specified. It's specified. It's just, it's an <laughs> One lucky harbor seal somewhere in the world <laughs> will be adopted. Excellent. Yeah. So now I can feel the tension, just like Mart was feeling it before, and we will announce what jury decided and who won the Emmaton competition, and Mart yes. will come and present this. So I would like to invite Hanna Jarvinen from... Uh, um, from Pharmaceutical Information Center to uh, announce our winner for this year. Hi everyone! So we really liked all the solutions and we think all of them should be implemented. Uh, group 1, we liked the idea of using social media and bringing people together. And group, group three, we thought the presentation was very good and inspiring. But as a winner, we selected a group two with solutions for doctors. Yeah, we can give applause. <laughs> so when thinking from the point of view of our company, you guys best answer to the given assignment, and you really gave us some solutions we can work for and develop more. And you gathered some uh, information of great value that we can also use. And we also like the idea of uh, consumers returning uh, medicine to doctors, so the actually used uh, drug amounts can be evaluated, and maybe this uh, data could also be delivered to the pharma companies so we can affect the whole medicine uh, supply chain like by this method. So, congrats. Congratulations to the team and thank you again for all the teams for your excellent suggestions. I really hope they all get published. Can we give a hand for everyone? And we are not quite out of awards yet. Next, we will have the 2019 Nordic Sustainable Healthcare Award. So I'd like to invite to the stage Daniel Eriksson, who is the founder and project manager at the Nordic Center for Sustainable Healthcare.
very much. Uh, as uh, I was introduced, my name is Daniel Eriksson. I'm from Nordic Center for Sustainable Healthcare. We work with sustainability in our wide range with a lot of focus on environmental sustainability. We're a member organization with around 100 members from 13, 14 countries nowadays. So the Nordics are growing out of the Nordics, so to say. We want to say thank you to EMA for letting us be here today and then during this fantastic conference. So thank you very much for that. We have three awards to hand out today uh, for the third year in a row. And this is the first time we're doing this in Finland. We had had the award ceremony in Sweden for two years in, uh, prior to this one. Uh, the first winner is, as one of the largest healthcare organizations in the Nordics, who is leading the sustainable healthcare work in Finland? So the sustainable healthcare organizer of the year in the Nordics 2019 is who's? And here to accept the award are Marco, Chief Medical Officer, and Virpi and Jari from the Sustainability Section. As you learned yesterday, they also got a little something for midsummer. It's on Friday. Yeah. The second winner, the Nordic Sustainable Healthcare Organization of the Year 2019. Uh, global with a strong Nordic base, Schneider shows how large companies can take a key role in the healthcare transformation towards sustainability. Schneider Electric, welcome on stage to. We have three different categories. The first one was the organizer, a bigger organization. The next one was organization, a bigger company. And now it's a smaller, not a smaller award, but a award for an innovation instead. So the next, the last award is for the sustainable healthcare innovation of the year 2019. A revolutionary antimicrobial innovation developed by nature, perfected by science, sustainable healthcare in true sense. Nordschild from Finland. Welcome on stage to Janne Hakkonen. So thank you very much, and thank you so much to Emma for letting us have this sermon here today, and congratulations to the winners. Thank you. Thank you, and congratulations again to the winners, and we're getting towards the end, so I will invite Federico to come and say closing words. Thank you, Anno. First of all, let me thank you for uh, being a, such a great moderator uh, through all the conference. Um, we should have a slide maybe with the next. Thanks a lot. Um, it's my duty is to uh, make final thanks and then I will have a few words uh, uh, about the next step in, uh, in EMA. First of all, let me thank you all the sponsors. I'm not, I'm not gonna 
uh, name all of them, but you can see we've been very, very well supported by a number of institutions, and hopefully uh, everyone actually uh, found value in, in being with Emma. We certainly have, uh, uh, we, we, we had the great value in having all them on board with, with us. So this is also uh, a good, I'd rather say, um, uh, t testimony of uh, how much is important uh, that uh, such a conference as Emma uh, is integrated and is very, very connected with the uh, uh, real world environment uh, as the sponsors uh, really uh, manifested this, uh, this uh, closeness to us. So thank you so, so much. Uh, I also want also to thank the, the students from the University of Alto, which uh, volunteer for the um, architectural tour. Uh, thank you so much. I, I have to say I took part of it uh, half an hour, but couldn't uh, finish it, but it was uh, really great. And I want also to thank uh, um, Annie Tuminen and the former member of parliament, uh, Perthi uh, Salalanian, for uh, giving us the, the, the Beard Watch tour. I don't know. Uh, I wasn't able to, to join it, but uh, uh, those that went actually said it was, was really great. So having finished the, uh, uh, the thanks, I, let, me, let me say two words about um, the future. Uh, as many of you know, uh, uh, we, um, we have a change in the directorship of EMA because uh, uh, Usman Khan joined the European Patient Forum uh, a couple of months ago. So I want to uh, take this opportunity also to, to thank you, Usman, uh, for what you've been doing for, uh, for EMA. Uh, if we are here in, uh, in SNK, it's also because we've done all of this. And, uh, here. <clears throat> So, uh, because of that, actually, we had a little bit of a slowdown in, in some of the activities, and, and one of these is the fact that we're not yet ready to announce uh, next year uh, location for the conference, even if we have a place, obviously, where we're heading up, but uh, we're going to uh, give a formal, I would say, formal announcement in a couple of weeks, three weeks' time from now. So, we're going to send a save the date uh, by the by, um, beginning of July, or as soon as possible, uh, in order to make sure that everyone uh, already can plan uh, the, the next conference. And, and every year, uh, it, this is my, my perception, every year we're trying to improve to make it better. So again, it's going to take uh, more effort, it's going to take uh, uh, more investment. We're, gonna, we're willing to do this. So we'll, we'll, once we're going to be ready, we'll come out and, and announce uh, where we're going uh, for next, next year. But certainly it's going to be, uh, again, a great conference. Uh, and then the last, uh, the last words uh, uh, is my reflection about uh, this conference. First of all, I found it really refreshing the fact that there's so many people that close in plenary. Usually the closing plenary were not so much <laughs> participated. Uh, this is, I think, is, uh, is part of the uh, feeling that I get from this conference. I had... Uh, 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 I had the opportunity, obviously, to, to participate only to few of the sessions, but everyone was really uh, very happy the way that the, the different sessions uh, worked. There was a lot of participation, uh, active interaction, uh, diversity discussion. So I, I think the, the, at the end, if I have to say in one word, uh, what really makes uh, 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 EMA conference was to be uh, in your agenda is the fact that when you come here, you got a different feeling. You, you, you got the feeling of participating like a big family which is willing to discuss uh, things really openly, uh, where everyone can contribute. Uh, it's, not, it's not a place like a typical academic conference, which if you're not have a certain standout from the academic viewpoint, you cannot talk, or whether a certain discourse or trust in the agenda. Everything here can be discussed, can be debated, and everyone has a place uh, to do this. So. Uh, I thank you all of you as a participants because I think if, if this is the feeling is because all of you are participate in this conference really as a community uh, and everyone is, uh, um, is adding value to the conference itself. So the diversity, the richness of discussions, uh, the depth of the discussion itself, uh, the Ematon itself actually was, a, was another showcase of, of how Emma can, can create value, I think really makes this conference so unique. So having said that, uh, this was my first year as president. I really want to thank also the Emma board uh, for the support they gave me in, in my role. I also want to thank the Emma Board for whatever, for everything they've done over the last month to make this happening. I want to also thank the uh, members of EMA. Uh, we had a, a fantastic, what I say, from my viewpoint, general assembly in which I really felt their continuous support. And I want to thank obviously all the staff of EMA that make this possible: uh, Nadia, Michele, obviously uh, Federica, but also Adriana, Flavio, and Tiana. Thank you so much. Uh, without you, this one. 
this would not be possible. And uh, stay tuned, we're gonna send you the email as soon as possible uh, with the next uh, uh, conference, EMA 2020. Have a nice trip back. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Federico, and on behalf of every one of us here in Finland, thank you so much, everybody, for coming here. We're glad that you got to enjoy the weather, and we really hope that you had a nice time, and thank you for Emma for bringing this conference here. We're now concluding the conference. There is lunch served outside, so feel free to um, go and grab some before you head out. And uh, safe travels, and welcome back. Thank you. Thank you.